Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the month of May is actually Celiac Disease Awareness Month, so I thought what better topic to bring up than what on earth is celiac disease? Now before I can begin, I do have to put a disclaimer in here, I am not a doctor, I'm not a dietitian, and I'm not a nutritionist. If you're concerned about any signs or symptoms that you may be experiencing yourself, please speak to a healthcare professional um, just to get the correct diagnosis and just take this video as a learning experience. Oh, I need to get comfortable for this one. I'm going to try my best to uh, condense this guy to a bit of a shorter video. I could literally talk about this for hours. <laughs> I'm going to try my best. I really am. Now, as I mentioned in my first video, um, I was diagnosed with celiac disease just over three years ago, but for the sake of this video, I'm gonna try and keep this a little less personal and a little more generic. Because chances are, if you've clicked on this video, either you've been diagnosed with celiac disease, a family member or a friend has been diagnosed with celiac disease and you just wanna get a little bit more information about it. Um, now, I have actually written down quite a few notes. <laughs> on what to say in this video in particular, um, but I am. I'm going to try and keep this as condensed as I can. <laughs> now first things first, let's get one thing straight. Celiac disease is not an allergy. It is an autoimmune disease. So when a food protein called gluten gets into our system, it makes its way to the small intestine. When it makes its way here, an autoimmune uh, response is triggered. When this response is triggered, the little hair-like projections that is within the small intestine, they're called villi, they will now be flattened instead of being out. The problem with this is the small intestine is where nutrients, vitamins, minerals, anything that we need to survive and to run, um, it can't be absorbed through those little uh, finger-like projections. This then causes malnutrition, and that is a big problem. Now, over time, this malnutrition can start to affect many other systems within the body. This is why there is such a big, large range amount of symptoms that can come with celiac disease, and why it is so hard to become diagnosed with celiac disease. The crazy thing is, is it just takes one crumb to, to trigger a response within the body. One crumb, that's it. That's crazy! Now I think the next big question is, what is gluten? Well, this is a food protein found in wheat, barley, rye, and sometimes oats. There are gluten-free oats out there that are certified gluten-free and may be safe for some celiacs. However, here in Canada and the United States, they do still allow oats into a celiac's diet. However, over in Australia and New Zealand for instance, it is not allowed. So I feel like oats is a is an up in the air kind of situation. You may have to just test them out and see if you react to them. Um, I personally myself have noticed that I can't I can't eat them. Um, I will react to them. Um, and there are some websites that have said that once your TTG level, which is the again the level that they look for in your blood, um, for celiac disease, once that has dropped to a normal level, um, you may actually be able to start reintroducing oats at that point. So I am personally still healing right now and every time that I put oats back in, I react to them. So you kind of just have to play around with it and see what will work for you. Um, now gluten can be found in cereals, breads, cookies, uh, crackers, uh, basically everything that's really tastes very good. <laughs> All of the good things. Um, processed foods as well. So it is very important that when you go out and buy anything that is processed, uh, if you do not, do not know where it's coming from um, or where it's been made, it is very important to read the label and be sure that it does not contain gluten. Now, next thing in the process is how are you diagnosed with celiac disease? And this is typically a two-step process. First step is being sent for a blood test, which is exactly what happened with me. They look for a TTG level in your blood body, so this is an antibody for celiac disease within the blood. 
If you are high in this antibody, it typically means that uh, you are positive for celiac disease. So high meaning 40 to 300 plus. Um, or above 12 is even high for uh, the TTD levels. Now if you're high in the blood test, you will now be sent for level 2, which is going to get your biopsy done. Um, which is when they will do a gastroscopy uh, where they will stick a tube down your throat with a uh, video camera on the end of it um, and it, they will take a section of your small intestine to test and see if those little villi in the small intestine are flattened or if they're still up and running. If they are flattened, that typically means that you do for sure have celiac disease, um, and that is the final diagnosis for celiac disease. Confirmed celiac. Now the next thing to keep in mind is if you are going to be going for either the biopsy or the blood test, you have to have gluten in your system for it to become positive. If you do not have gluten in your system, for at least six to eight weeks or longer, um, you could have a false negative blood test come up. So that is something to really keep into consideration if you are thinking that you may have celiac disease and you wanna go and get this test done. Regardless if it's the blood test or the biopsy, gluten has to be in your system. So it's something called the gluten challenge, which is what you'll be put on where you have to eat the equivalent of two slices of bread um, every day for, again, like I said, six to eight weeks, which if you've been off of gluten for a little while, putting it back into your system and you're 100% a celiac, that can be a bit nerve wracking because you're gonna be sick. Now that we got most of the basics down, you may be wondering what kind of symptoms can occur with someone who has celiac disease? Well, friends, let me tell you. There are so many. <laughs> now, to date, there are more than 300 known symptoms of celiac disease, and they can vary from person to person. That means that one person is gonna have a symptom and the next person may not. The other big thing, too, is that there is only 1% of the population actually has celiac disease. However, with that being said, 83% of people who have celiac disease are either misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. 83%! That is a huge percentage. Like that's the kind of percentage I wish I got on my math tests in high school. 83%! What? Now those varying symptoms that I was talking about can literally be one person who has diarrhea and abdominal pain to another person who may have depression or anxiety. The other big thing too is sometimes symptoms will start early on in life and sometimes it will start later into adulthood. Or the other crazy thing is, is you could have celiac disease and not have any signs or symptoms at all. What is worse is if this is left untreated, people with celiac disease can develop further complications. Complications such as other autoimmune diseases, osteoporosis, thyroid diseases, and certain types of cancers. And that is just to name a few. I'm kind of starting to feel like we need to start getting people diagnosed with this pronto. Now you're probably wondering exactly what types of symptoms can occur with celiac disease. Um, and as I mentioned, there are more than 300 known. Uh, so I've written down some of the top ones that I could think of, and I'm gonna have to read them out to you because there's so many of them, and I don't wanna miss them. Um, but just keep in mind that there's actually a lot more than what I'm about to tell you. So, let's get right into it. Symptoms include, but are not limited to, Anemia, anxiety, bloating or gas, constipation, delayed growth in kids, depression, diarrhea, discolored teeth, fatigued or tiredness, headaches or migraines, abdominal pain, hair loss, infertility, irritability, joints and muscle pain, liver disease, pale nose sores are also known as canker sores, poor weight gain or weight gain, thin bones, tingling and numbness, restless leg syndrome, decreased sleep, keep holding on, there's more, 
More neurological symptoms such as ADHD, learning disabilities, lack of muscle coordination, and seizures. And then my favorite, the one that I've always had, an itchy red skin rash called dermatitis herpetiformis. Herpet, 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 herpetiform. Oh, since I have learned this word, I have not been able to say it. I honestly have struggled. I herpeti. Herpeti mm, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Dermatitis herpetiformis. Herpeti herpetiformis. Dermatitis herpetiformis. I'm gonna write it on the screen right here. I think I just did it. Dermatitis herpetiformis. You're never gonna forget this one. Dermatitis herpetiformis. Now of all the symptoms that I have just listed, anemia, delayed growth, and weight loss are all signs of malnutrition. Now malnutrition can be a huge problem and is a big problem in everyone, but especially in kids. When kids are malnourished and not getting adequate nutrition, they will not develop properly. So with all that being said, if you are noticing any of these signs in either yourself or your kids, it may be worth going to speak to a healthcare professional like your doctor to see if you need to be diagnosed for celiac disease. Now, the next topic to talk about is the causes of celiac disease. As I mentioned before, celiac disease is a genetic autoimmune disease. Which means that if you do not have the genetic predisposition for this disease, it is very unlikely that you do or will ever have celiac disease. Now, if you do have the genetic predisposition for celiac disease, there are certain scenarios that can actually make this disease become active. Certain scenarios such as surgeries, pregnancies, childbirth, viral infections, severe emotional stresses, or traumas. Now some other risk factors to developing celiac disease is having a family member who has been diagnosed with celiac disease or dermatitis herpetiformis. Aha, there's that word again. Dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, or someone who already has an existing autoimmune disease. Because for those of you who do not know, this is not always the case, but sometimes when you develop an autoimmune disease, it is likely and can be likely that you may may develop another autoimmune disease. Now, there are two different types of celiac disease uh, next to this that I'm just learning about. Um, so I don't know too much about it, um, but I will read some definitions off of the Mayo Clinic as to what they are. Um, however, there is a non-responsive celiac disease and then a refractory celiac disease. Um, so these two are quite rare. The refractory one is quite rare from what I understand. Non-responsive celiac disease kind of sounds like what was going on with me and is going on with me right now. Um, so let me read you those definitions. So from the Mayo Clinic, the definition of a non-responsive celiac person, disease, <laughs> Um, is some people with celiac disease don't respond to what they consider to be a gluten-free diet. Non-responsive celiac disease is often due to cross-contamination of the diet with gluten. So working with a dietitian can help to avoid this from happening. Um, I can kind of relate with this one in particular um, because I personally haven't been able to get my levels to drop for over two years. Um, and just recently I found out that I did actually get them to drop just a little bit, but it was a drop. Um, but I'll talk about that in another blog. Um, but uh, essentially I think what was going on with me in particular is I was getting little micro cross contaminations either going out to eat or in processed foods. So that's non-responsive celiac disease. Now again, the definition off of the Mayo Clinic uh, for refractory celiac disease, I'll write these things up on the screen as I start to talk about them in case you want to look up uh, a little bit further about yourself. Um, so in rare instances, the intestinal injury of celiac disease doesn't respond to a strict gluten-free diet, aka it's not healing to a gluten-free diet. This is known as refractory celiac disease. If you have 
signs and symptoms after following a gluten-free diet for six months to one year, you might need further testing to look into other explanations for your symptoms. Oh man, this has been a whirlwind of a video. <laughs> um, like I said, that is just like a small blip into what celiac disease is. I tried to put the most important information that I could into this video, um, but I will say this time and time again. Um, be sure to do your own research. Read multiple different websites, different blogs. Make sure that the information can be trusted on those websites and blogs. Um, and if all else fails, I mean, talk to your healthcare professional, your doctor, your nutritionist, your dietitian. Naturopaths are great for this kind of stuff as well. Um, but that, that would just be my advice, is just make sure that you're looking into the correct information on what celiac disease is and where you can go uh, to get the correct answers and how to heal from it. So if you like this video, please subscribe, like, and comment down below, especially if you want me to go into more of an extended version of this video explaining a little bit more about celiac disease, or if you want me to talk to you about my own personal experience with it, um, please let me know, and I will see you in the next one. Okay, bye guys!